Hello, my name is Jane Cockcroft and I work in the learning team at the Ashmolean Museum. I'm very pleased to welcome you to our One World event today, the third programme in this online festival, which celebrates the many communities and faiths of Oxfordshire. Our festival theme is Light in the Darkness, a thematic thread that runs through all our events. Today's programme aims to celebrate the new year, but is also mindful of the need to be reflective and how important it is to hold on to hope. Even though we start 2021 in such difficult times, there is light ahead. Today's festival programme will start with a Light in the Darkness multi-faith panel discussion by Oxfordshire faith leaders, exploring this theme of reflection and hope, an initiative coordinated by Imam Manawar Hussein. This will be followed by dance and music performances, a stained glass craft activity, a talk from an Ashmolean curator, and finally a poetry and storytelling performance. The programme will last for just over one hour and 30 minutes. Please feel free to settle down and watch the whole event or dip in and out. Remember too that if you'd like to watch again or share with friends, all the One World Festival programmes will be available soon after the broadcasting of each event on the Ashmolean's YouTube channel. My co-host today will be Javid Malik, who is on the One World Committee and is Vice Chair of Oxford Council of Faiths. Javid will also be chairing the panel discussion, so that is where we begin. Thank you, Javid. Welcome to the Light in the Darkness, Reflections and Hope multi-faith virtual discussion. Since the beginning of 2020, the world as a whole and community everywhere have been facing the devastating effects of COVID-19 pandemic. Tens of millions of people are facing bereavement, isolation and fear, while many more are falling into extreme poverty. In addition to this economic and social disruption, the pandemic has impacted religion in various ways, including the cancellation of the worship services of various faiths and the closure of religious institutions, schools, as well as the cancellation of pilgrimages, ceremonies and festivals, etc. In testing times, faith communities have always sought refuge and solace in their faith traditions to strengthen their resolve and to deal with exceptionally hard times. We have also seen outpouring of incredible love, kindness and generosity. Light is one of the oldest and most meaningful symbols depicting the spiritual and the divine. World religions often utilize the analogy of light when speaking of a divine presence in human life. Light is referred to as the source of goodness and the ultimate reality. Darkness on the other hand is associated with chaos, death and the underworld in many religions and faith traditions. Light has been celebrated in almost all faith traditions in one way or another, from Diwali in Hinduism to Lalatul Bara, which is the night of salvation in Islam, and Hanukkah in Judaism, Christmas in Christianity, etc. To explore our theme of light in the darkness, reflections and hope, we are joined by leaders from our major faiths in the city. We have among ourselves today, Prajna Kitu from the Buddhist community is co-founder of the Oxford Triretna Buddhist Center and a former convener of young Buddhist activities in Triretna for Europe. From the Muslim community, we have Imam Manavar Hussain. He's a founder of the Oxford Foundation. He's also a Muslim chaplain at the Oxford University Hospitals NHS Foundation Trust. From the Hindu community, we have Chintakali. She's a former chairperson and still actively involved with the Oxford Hindu Temple and Community Center project. From the Sikh community, we have Gurdeep Singh Saini, who is a secretary of the Oxford Sikh Temple. From the Jewish community, we have Penny Faust. She is a co-president of the Oxford Jewish Congregation and a former chair of the Oxford Council of Faiths. Dr. Stephen Vickers, JP, is from the Baha'i community. He's an, he's an educationalist 
and he's a chair of trustees of the International Tree Foundation. From the Christian community, we have Reverend Charlotte Bannister Parker. She's associate chaplain to the Bishop of Oxford, an associate priest for the University Church of St. Mary the Virgin. And she's a co-founder of the Oxford's annual interfaith French Evoke. You all are very warmly welcome. So I'd like to invite now uh, Rajna Kittu from the Buddhist community with his reflection. So at the start of the first lockdown, uh, way back last year in the spring, I was struck by how different the two approaches were uh, of two different cafes in the city. Uh, so one, one of them very rapidly fashioned a, a kind of kiosk um, uh, at the front of their shop. Uh, they bought some outdoor furniture and even a gazebo so that the, uh, their customers could wait socially distance under, under cover while they, uh, they waited for their coffee and patisseries. Um, another cafe had a different approach. They closed the door and they put up a sign saying, we'll open again at the end of the lockdown. Now with the first cafe, things have been hard. Yeah, things have um, been particularly difficult for the hospitality industry uh, in general, but that cafe is still in business and they are still uh, continuing to serve those coffees and patisseries. The second cafe, however, never reopened. Now, I, I must admit that uh, when the pandemic situation first arose, uh, my, my response was, I, I'm ashamed to say, it was, it was more of the, the nature of the second cafe, um, wanting to just hold out and waiting until such a time as things returned to normality. Fortunately, it didn't take me very long to realize that this attitude wasn't going to work. Um, it wasn't going to help. And in fact, it flies in the face of the teachings of the Buddha. So the, the first uh, noble truth of the Buddha is that of suffering, of unsatisfactoriness, the Buddhist word for which is dukkha. Now the, uh, the folk etymology of the word dukkha uh, appeals to an image of an ill-fitting wheel. Uh, an ill-fitting wheel, which uh, even today is, uh, is very regularly seen around Oxford. Um, and it conveys uh, the sense of this kind of repetitive, clung, 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 you know, sort of predictable uh, bumpiness, uh, which, um, which sort of stands in the way of what it is we're, we're hoping to do, what, what it is we're, we're trying to, to do with our lives and, and with our, well, the projects of our lives. And of course, these bumps can take all kinds of different forms from personal illness um, to loss of a loved one uh, to political unrest and more generally the changing circumstances that we find ourselves in. Now the point of this teaching of Dukkha is not as a, a glib justification for pessimism or cynicism as a kind of oh yeah I, I told you it would be like this, I told you so, um, nor is it voicing a disgruntlement um, that you know if only I'd done Da, 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 da. Well, now things would be okay. The point of this teaching is that actually conditions are never perfect. Now, whatever it is we're trying to do, conditions will never be 100% in support of them. And what I find so inspiring about the attitude of the first cafe that I mentioned was that they just got on with the job. Okay, the job was different. The job was harder in many respects, um, but there's always something. There's always something that gets in the way. And this is the challenge to us now, uh, to keep in view what, what really matters to us, uh, especially in the face of the, the, the change and the difficulties that, we, uh, that we're experiencing. Uh, mindfulness as a quality is a very well-known teaching of the Buddha, but uh, a lesser known aspect of mindfulness is mindfulness of purpose. Uh, so staying in touch with what inspires and what guides us. Uh, for Buddhists, uh, this uh, inspiration and guidance is uh, in the form of the possibility of waking up from the darkness of ignorance, uh, just as the Buddha did. And famously, it's described as enlightenment. But the light of enlightenment isn't a light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, it's not something that we hold out for when things are tough in the, in the hope that it will, it will uh, resolve things for us. It's a light instead of compassionate awareness, which we bring to whatever life throws at us. 
And of course, we, we don't know what the external challenges are going to be over the coming days, weeks, months, even years. But the internal challenge that the Buddha sets for us is to continue to develop the qualities of mindfulness, of patience, wisdom, generosity, uh, and energy that regardless of the circumstances are uh, always in demand. Thank you very much, Prajnakitu. I'd now like to invite Imam Monavar Hussain from the Muslim community. Thank you very much, Javed. In the name of God, the infinitely good, the most merciful. 2020 has been one of the most challenging years in the life of the human family. The impact of the COVID-19 pandemic has been all pervasive to human life, impacting us personally, economically, socially, and culturally. We are programmed to be social, to touch, embrace, and inhabit the same physical space. None of that has been possible. What weighs heavily on many souls is not only the loss of loved ones, family, young and old, friends, neighbors, community elders, but the fact that we could not be present at the moment of their departure from this life or at their burial. So many stories, memories of the journey of our elders to this city and country, their experiences, dreams and aspirations, all lost to the future generations as they return to their creator. When struck with bereavement, loss or some calamity, the oft repeated verse from the Quran for Muslims is, verily we are from God and to him is our return. He reminded that our journey's beginning and end is the merciful God. To give the full context within which this verse sits, I provide here the verses that precede and follow it in the Quran, chapter two, verses 155 to 157. And certainly we shall test you with something of fear, hunger, loss of wealth, lives and fruits, but give glad tidings to the patient, who when afflicted with calamity say, truly to God we belong, and tr truly to him we shall return. They are those on whom are the blessings and grace from their Lord, and they are those who receive his mercy, and it is they who are the guided ones. These verses point to the ebbs and flows of life, the highs and lows that we will experience in one lifetime. However, what is striking is that it is as if all the storms of a lifetime have been gathered together in this single COVID-19 moment. Under these circumstances, Muslims are reminded through these verses that this life is a test and that we respond to challenges of life through patience and through the remembrance of God. When we are being tested in whatever field of endeavor, the aim is to find solutions and answers to the questions being asked. Indeed, the prophet, blessings and peace be upon him, taught that except for death, there is a cure for every disease. Our response to the questions this pandemic has asked us has been one of solidarity, of love, compassion, generosity of spirit, and acts of kindness across our beautiful county and country. So many have volunteered to shop for the vulnerable, to look out for those living on their own. Our NHS and frontline service personnel have served their fellow citizens with great distinction. And of course, the scientists and researchers who have worked tirelessly day and night to develop the vaccines that provide great hope and light in our darkest moment. To all we owe a great debt of gratitude. Lord, grant cure to the sick and patience and strength to their loved ones. Lord, bless with strength, good physical health and mental health, all those NHS and frontline staff involved in the care of the sick in our hospitals across the United Kingdom. Lord, bless with success all those involved in the COVID-19 vaccine rollout across the United Kingdom. Lord, as we move into 2021, please lift this terrible pandemic from our world. I conclude this prayer in the words of Imam Zain al-Abidin, upon whom be peace, 
the great grandson of the Prophet, blessing and peace be upon him. O oh God, bless Muhammad and his household. Respond to my supplication. Come near my call. Have mercy on my pleading. Listen to my voice. <clears throat> Cut not short my hope for thee. Sever not my thread to thee. Turn not my face in this my need in other needs away from thee. Attend for my sake to the fulfillment of my request. The granting, <clears throat> the granting of my need and the attainment of what I have asked before I leave this place. Through thy making easy for me the difficult and thy excellent ordainment for me in all of my affairs. Thy bounty has comforted me and thy beneficence as shown the way. So I ask thee by thee, and by Muhammad and his household, thy blessings be upon them, that thou sendest me not back in dis disappointment. Amen. Thank you very much, uh, Imam Manawar. And I would like to invite uh, Chintakali from the Hindu community. Namaste and greetings to all of you from Durban in South Africa. I would like to sing a few lines dedicated to my extended family and the wide circle of supporters all around the world. Allah <laughs> Ishwar Tero Naam Sab Ko Sanmati De Bhagavan Allah Tero Naam This means your name is Allah, your name is Ishwar, your name is Jesus. Bring peace. O oh Lord, to everyone. I conclude with the Hindu prayer for peace. Om Asatoma Satgamaya, Tamasoma Jyotir Gamaya, Mrityorma Amritam Gamaya. This means, O oh Supreme Spirit, lead us from untruth to truth from darkness to light, and from death to immortality. Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Thank you very much, Chinta. And I'd like to invite Gurdeep Singh Saini from the Sikh community. Vaheguru Ji ka khalsa, Vaheguru Ji ki fateh. My name is Gurdeep Saini. I'm representing Sikh community. Our Granth Sahib Gurbani says, Aval Allah Noor Paya Kudrat Ke Sab Bande Ek Noor Te Sab Jag Upjya Kaun Pale Kaun Mande. This means that God is created. The Creator is one. And uh, the, it's all nature think they, I mean, it's created by the nature and uh, they, uh, in his eyes, no one is better, no one is bad. God treats everyone the same, which we can. So there is another teaching in our Sikh religion, kar pala, ho pala. If you do good job, you help others, and uh, you you will be helped by God as well. So the our Gurbani encourage the community to help others and share uh, them in the their difficult hard time. My prayer is always for the uh, every community, all the world. We always say prayers, and we are doing the regular. Uh, our uh, uh, parts, we, we call it. So we read the whole book 
and uh, after that we do the prayer then we start it again and uh, i think uh, every religion uh, if we will start doing like that so i'm sure this uh, this thing will be finished very soon and let's hope the, for the best and let's uh, uh, communicate with each other and help all the other religions as well wahiguru ji ka khalsa wahiguru ji ki fate thank you i'd like to invite penny fast from the jewish community thank you javed i'd like to begin by reminding everyone that the hebrew scriptures beginning in genesis starts by pointing out that god created light it was the first thing that happened and that there was a separation of light from the darkness and i like to think that it is the human responsibility to bring light into dark places so many good things depend on light vision safety life itself that it's readily seen as benevolent darkness by contrast spells hidden danger and seems sinister so we speak of the light of knowledge reason and redemption and of the darkness of ignorance superstition and death and it's tempting to attribute the two realms to two conflict conflicting cosmic powers as some religions have done but judaism has always stood by the idea that all exi that exists darkness and light are both the creation of god nevertheless it's with light that god is especially associated it's the metaphor that seems most naturally to describe the human experience of the divine and god's first act that creation story was the creation of light the movement from darkness to be light, to light can be seen as the whole purpose of god's activity both in the lives of individuals and in the life of humanity history is one long battle between the forces of light and the forces of darkness and the jewish task symbolized by the eternal flame is to diffuse the light of god's truth among the nations so that the age of redemption may dawn now that eternal flame is present in any every synagogue it was in the original temple it is a light that's kept burning all the time and i quite often receive school children in the synagogue and one of the first questions they always ask is why have you got that light burning above the cupboard well the cupboard is the ark and the ark contains the first five books of the bible and that represents the law in jewish eyes it is the commandments which are the lamp and the doing from the commandments which is the light and for us that flame above the ark is the eternal flame to remind us always of the presence of god teaching is a way of disseminating light goodness me we haven't we've experienced teaching over the past year if you talk about government regulations we keep having to relearn what the laws are we keep having to be aware of other people and i definitely believe that the covid pandemic has not been all bad it has brought us into communities street communities people who very often have never really talked to their neighbors before have come together to support each other and that's been a real ray of light which my hope is will carry on beyond the time when the pandemic i am sure will end we believe that you cover yourself with light as with a garment so that you can indeed go out into the world to do good and everyone has that capacity it is all of our responsibilities to take part in our communities to support each other and to help and that certainly has been a blessing in this time of covid we talk also uh, one of our prophets isaiah talks about the people who walk in darkness 
have seen will see a great light. We are never left alone in the sense that God is always with us to support us. And I would like to end with a prayer. In my great need for light, I look to you, eternal God. Help me to feel your presence, even when dark shadows fall upon me. When our own weakness and the storms of life hide you from our sight, help us to know that you've not deserted us. Uphold me with the comfort of your love. Give me trust, O God. Give me peace and give us light. May our hearts find their rest in you. Thank you very much, Penny. I now like to invite uh, Dr. Stephen Wickers, JP, from the Baha'i community. COVID-19 is the latest in a long line of epidemics and other trials which have challenged humanity throughout history. Our interconnected world has allowed it negatively to impact almost every territory. Thus, it has brought darkness to those who have died, to their families, friends and neighbours, to overworked and exhausted medics, and to children whose education has been disrupted. The health of some survivors may be impaired for years to come, as oxygen starvation damages vital organs. In addition, many others have lost their livelihoods. On reflection, we realize this pandemic will probably not prove as devastating as earlier plagues, but that does not make it any easier to bear. Nor is blame appropriate, but learning is. We may in time conclude that its negative effects across most of the world community were initially magnified by confronting with the tools of a bygone age and the outworn shibboleth of unfettered national, sov national sovereignty a virus which recognizes no international boundaries. This, however, is not the time to snipe, but to work together. We can regret the sloth of the global community to begin working in concert, the lack of trust in or funding of the World Health Organization, and the animal cruelty and overcrowding which encourages interspecies transmission of viruses but all we can do is to learn from these and to work together in the future for the benefit of all, benefit of all humankind. To people of faith, there is light even in the midst of darkness. A light which will not only enable humanity to pull together rapidly to defeat such other crises as will inevitably emerge, but a light which will facilitate world unity and mitigate or eliminate many challenges which today seem intractable. The God in whom we put our trust will never fail us. Even if our limited understanding and our lack of faith sometimes drives us to despair. We have seen true heroism in medical staff and carers, many of whom have given their lives in the face of initial poor understanding of this new threat. Restauranteurs and their staff provided free or cheap meals to the needy or to medical staff. Truck drivers, shop workers and utility workers put themselves at risk to keep us supplied. For many, it is faith and love for humanity which keeps them going, which enables them to be heroic. Religion has a power which speaks to the human soul as well as to humanity collectively. Faiths have rushed to serve their own congregations online and by telephone, with assistance with shopping and combating isolation. Online religious services have proved a boon to the isolated and to people in care homes. We have all also learned the bounty, as stated in the Baha'i writings of consorting with the followers of all religions in joy and fragrance. And that the earth is but one country and mankind its citizens. We have learned that we are all the fruits of one tree, the leaves of one branch, the flowers of one garden. And we remember, glory not that you love your country, 
but glory that you love mankind. It is in working together that people are finding the way out of the pandemic. At first, numbers and scientific findings were not shared liberally, but most countries are doing their best to cooperate, enabling a better and more effectively funded international disease control system to emerge. And light upon light, we have seen how the fruits of cooperation have speedily created a plethora of apparently effective vaccines. Most humbling of all to me is the establishment of COVAX, an arrangement where 168 countries will freely share surplus doses and vaccine delivery systems. Religions have leapt to address the needs of mankind, regardless of faith or country. We must not forget that the eradication of smallpox and polio have been co-funded by a voluntary NGO, the Rotary Club, as well as the WHO. What could the combined forces of religions with billions of adherents achieve against disease? To achieve this, we need to come to a more mature understanding of what it is to be human. Baha'is believe that we are created to know and to love God and to carry forward an ever advancing civilization. Our brains and our intellects, as well as our souls, if used with humility, are servants of the divine plan. Science and religion are two wings by which the bird of humanity will ascend. Science without religion tends to materialism, while religion without science tends to superstition. We should not allow our limited understanding to set us against the honest findings of science. Mass vaccination will control the virus in a way that nothing else has. Cooperation across boundaries of religion, nation and class will help sweep away those barriers and not only mitigate the effect of future viruses, but help us to encourage centuries old mistrusts and mutual antagonisms. In my garden, I can see the first snowdrops. To the Victorians, they were a symbol of hope, the glimmerings of a better future. We can all see similar, similar glimmerings in the darkness. Prayer, community, trust, and international cooperation will see us through. I close with a short prayer, which I have found invaluable in addressing any difficulties that have come my way. Is there any removal of difficulties, save God? Say, praised be God, he is God. All are his servants and all abide by his bidding. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen. And last but not the least, I'd like to invite Reverend Charlotte Bannister Parker. Thank you so much for this opportunity to share with you some thoughts and reflections on light in the darkness and our sense of hope for this coming year. 2020 was no doubt a year of enormous um, struggle for so many. Uh, many ha people had to deal with grief, with setbacks, uh, with bereavement, uh, with loss of income, and a new way to communicate with their friends and family. Um, I want to share with you my opening of a prayer that was written about coping with the COVID pandemic and how our faith in this dystopian situation can bring us hope. In a COVID world, COVID-19 does not have to be the last word. The sun rose this morning. The dark of the evening will embrace us tonight. Yet all is changed. Fear and danger race through our lives and they are real. Yet people bound to their homes find each other and talk and laugh and share their fears. They gather online and call their loved ones and infirmed ones. 
the spirit of God is still moving. The last word is not a word at all, but is a sure presence of the holy, the presence of others in the midst of mayhem and in the life-giving efforts of people to care, deeply care for one another. And this is our hope. So as we gather this afternoon for One World and this event for the Ashmolean, the members of the interfaith movement and this seminar itself, for me, is hope. We are talking together, sharing together, experiencing each other's faith and religious experiences, and they all enrich us. Light for a Christian is interpreted in many ways. From the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament, we have the prophet Isaiah, prophet Jeremiah, who says, for I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. So those words of Jeremiah come to me as I think of us all being pioneers of life, of light, of life for our faith, our friends, our family and our local community and the international links that we share together. One of my favorite paintings is called The Light of Christ and it was written by Holman Hunt. Um, it is also known as The Light of the World and it actually hangs in Keble College here in Oxford. When the college is open, you can go and visit it. An extraordinary point of that painting is that Jesus is holding up a lantern, as he says in John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. I am the world, I am the light of the world. But interestingly, if you looked closely at the door, the door has no handle. It has to be opened from inside. And what I feel that gives us is that sense that we have to look out, open the door, out of our darkness, onto the light. And of course, that's what great faith leaders remind us of. They ask us and call on us to remember those words, that God is life and in him is no darkness at all. I remember and end with the words of Martin Luther King. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. And as the last speaker, I was taking notes from my other colleagues and I just wanted to draw together some of the themes that they've expressed this afternoon. As I draw on their reflections, I'm reminded of what was mentioned about today, the mindfulness of purpose and compassion of awareness, of the need to turn to the divine, to bring peace and respect, that we should be always reminded of the presence of the Lord in our lives, that he is the ray of light in our community and a light to facilitate world unity. So we come together, we share a common home this earth. And as we have come together to fight COVID-19, my hope for this year is that we can also come together to conserve our earth and care for creation. We need to protect it and conserve it, conserve it to enable love and compassion to flourish for all. So I end with a prayer. Dear Lord, help us to recognize <coughs> you above all else. Enlighten the eyes of our heart that we may see the divine and notice how your light is in our lives. Let your spirit and power breathe in us, through us, again, fresh and new. Give us hope that even in times of darkness, loss and despair, your presence brings us hope and joy of a new dawn. May your peace, which is beyond all understanding, Lead us, guide us, and protect us today and in the year to come. Amen. Thank you very much, Charlotte. Uh, now, we've 
coming to the end of our program. As you're aware, the COVID-19 vaccination campaigns has started in, in, in our country. And it's very important that everyone gets vaccinated. And I just like to invite our panel members to take a short time to give their views on getting vaccinated. Uh, I, my view is I think it's essential and I heartily encourage everyone to uh, obtain a vaccine. I think it's very important and we should uh, encourage other people as well and we should uh, get vaccinated. Yeah, it will help us to save our own lives but also the lives of others. I think, uh, I think vaccinations must be given. I think it's the responsibility of each person to look after their own health. We must all go for the vaccine when called and remember it will help to save our lives and equally the lives of other people. When my mother was a child, two children in the next door household died of smallpox. When I was a boy, some of my classmates were killed or debilitated by polo. We must take this vaccine and eradicate COVID-19 before it develops more and more variants and we can't stop it. My brother-in-law is an immunologist at the JR working on this vaccine. And throughout last year, he pointed to the importance of everybody getting vaccinated. It is the only way to stop the virus from affecting our lives long term. And it is the only way to protect yourself, your loved ones, your family and your friends and your wider community. Please get vaccinated. Once again, my sincere thanks to the Ashmolean Museum team and all the illustrious panel members for giving such a comprehensive perspective of light in the darkness in such a short time. This has reinforced the notion that we have so much more in common than our differences. In the meantime, take care, have faith, look after yourselves and your neighbors and stay blessed. Until next time, it's goodbye from me and my panel members. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye and thank you so much. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Take care. Keep safe. Thank you so much to the panelists for your thoughtful and inspiring words and important message about vaccinations. I'm now delighted to introduce Rahi Patel, a young, fantastically talented dancer from Oxford, who will be performing a dance to the prayer Shrey Ramstuti. Rahi will introduce her dance and tell you more about it. Thank you, Rahi. Hello, I am Rahi. Today I will be dancing to an ancient 16th century Sanskrit and regional script, Sri Ram Janmarakrapala, also called Sri Ram Stuti. It's a prayer which glorifies Sri Rama and his characteristics. In the story of Ramayan, Lord Ram was exiled for 40 years. During this time, he performed many deeds and banished demons like Ravana. The theme of lightness in dark is reflected in this song through the positivity and motivation seen in the Hindu god Ram. His many devotees around the world worship him daily and during Diwali, lamps are lit to welcome him and his wife Sita into our homes. This prayer praises all the feats he achieved during this period of time and the various stances in this dance depict the actions and accomplishments he attained. Thank you. Hope you enjoy this dance.
Many thanks to Rahi for her beautiful dancing. It fills me with hope that there are so many talented local young people like Rahi with so much to give. I'd now like to introduce a stained glass window craft activity by artist Emily Cooling as part of a collaboration between Cowley Road Works and the Rosams, a group of young disabled artists. The Rosams led an initiative called Windows of Kindness towards the end of last year, which invited East Oxford families, youth groups and schools to create their own window art to spread a message of kindness and hope. And you can still get involved. Sarah Airy from Cowley Road Works will introduce Emily's film and tell you more about Cowley Road Works and the Windows of Kindness project. We are so pleased to be able to promote this wonderful community project and share this craft activity with you. Cowley Road Works is the charity which organises Oxford's iconic Cowley Road Carnival. Every July, around 50,000 people come to celebrate Carnival, the highlight of our year. And in 2021, we're going to be celebrating 20 years since our first Carnival, which began as part of the regeneration of East Oxford. Inspired by the rich multicultural diversity of the area, community is right at the heart of our creative project work, which we do all year round with individuals and community groups in and around Oxford. We provide opportunities to learn and create while also bringing the community together, and especially we work with disadvantaged and vulnerable individuals and groups. Last year, the carnival did go ahead, but virtually on the 5th of July. The one and only benefit of having a virtual event is that people could join in from all around the world. And amazingly, people from 44 countries came to celebrate Cowley Road Carnival with us online. And at the end of the year, we were delighted to be involved in Oxford's Lights Festival with our Windows of Kindness project. And this is something that you can all get involved with too, by making your own windows of kindness to bring light and joy into your home, street and community and brighten these extraordinarily dark times. We work with several community groups to help them make stained glass window designs, including our group of young disabled artists, the Rawsoms. They came up with the idea of making these wonderful words of love, kindness and hope into windows. And they made these fabulous heart-shaped designs, which were put on display for the community to see as part of the light festival here. If you'd like to make your own, this film you're going to see shortly gives you the instructions. And you can also download step-by-step -step guides and templates from our website at cowleyroadworks.org. There are three designs to choose from, hearts, a shooting star and a butterfly. And once you've had a go at these, you could come up with your own designs for Windows of Kindness to bring much needed light and hope to brighten this darkness. And it'd be great if we could see these not just in Oxford, but all around the world too. How to make a stained glass window. Materials you need are a printed template or a template of your own design, black paper and colour tissue paper, scissors, a pencil or a pen, a long ruler, greaseproof paper or tracing paper, glue and a paintbrush or a print stick. If you don't have a ruler, you can use the side of a book or a magazine. Place your A4 black paper on the table and use your long ruler to create a frame, lining up the outer edge of your ruler with the outer edge of your paper and tracing the inside line. Do this on all four sides to create a frame. Don't worry if you don't have a ruler, you could use a book or a magazine or you can use the template and cut that out and trace it on instead. Draw some dots on the lines where they cross over. Then fold your paper in half with your pencil lines on the outside. Crease the centre fold. With your scissors cut along the pencil line up as far as the dots where you need to turn. Remember to turn at this point.
cut out your frame, saving the inner rectangle piece of black paper to cut out your template. Print out your design and check that it's smaller or, or just fits inside the leftover piece of paper that you've just cut out. Cut out your design out of the paper following the lines. Cut the inside of any shapes out too, the little window parts. Take your time and cut out the inside windows of your butterfly or your star or whatever shape you've chosen to draw or use as a design. Place your cut out paper design and put it on top of the black leftover paper. Trace round it with a pencil following the lines on the outside and the inside. And now you're going to have to cut this out too. Follow around the outside, doing the best you can, following the shape as best as you can. And then when it comes to cutting out the inside shapes, I poked a pencil through. You can then poke the tip of your scissors through that hole and cut out the inside windows. Next you want to get your greaseproof paper or tracing paper, lay it on the table and tape it down in all four corners. Get your black paper frame, lay it on top and trace round the outside edge, holding it down as you go along. and trace the inside shape as well. So we've now drawn the outside line and the inside line of our black frame. Now lay your design inside the frame that you've just drawn onto the greaseproof paper or tracing paper and draw around the inside windows that you've just cut out, which you're going to fill with coloured tissue paper. This is so you know where the windows are that you want to fill in a different colour. Choose the colours of tissue paper you want to use and cut each colour into a little pile of squares. We're then going to start using our tissue paper to decorate our design. Here I've chosen two green shades for the background of the butterfly. Carefully going around with some glue underneath, sticking my squares on. Not worrying too much if I go over the edge of the frame because the black paper will go on top of that to hide it. But filling all around the edge of the butterfly, not filling in the windows of the butterfly. Then finally, filling in the windows of the butterfly with the colours I want to use and making sure it's stuck down all nicely with the glue. And finally, sticking on the black template of the butterfly and the frame and making sure it's stuck down all neatly and securely. Here is another design, the shooting star. I've already pre-cut out the shooting star's black frame outline. Here I've traced round the outside of the star and the tail. So now we can fill in the tail and the star 
and the outside or background with whatever colours you wish. I'm going to fill the star with yellow and the tail with a mixture of orange and yellow and the background of the star is going to be blue. The star has got really tiny points so I had to cut some really small triangles of yellow tissue paper to fit inside the star corners. And here I blended orange and yellow together and then went on to fill the background with blue. Once you've coloured in all the tissue paper and added all the black frames, you can then cut away any excess grease proof paper from your finished stained glass window. You don't have to stick to the templates that I've given you. You can choose any design you like. It's up to you what you like to do, so feel free to choose your own design. Or if you want, try some words. Thanks so much to Cowley Road Works, The Rawsums and Emily Cooling for all the amazing work you do. Next up, I'm pleased to introduce music by the duo Del Navaz, featuring Dalaram Izadi, tabla player and singer, and Chris Hills, who plays a tabla. The following track was recorded soon after the duo got together. It's an interpretation of an ancient Persian tune, Jele Shahi, called in English, Before the King. The song would have been played to royalty and their visitors from across the Persian Empire. It's an instrumental track fusing Persian tunes and Hindustani rhythms. Enjoy. Thank you. 
Huge thanks to Chris and Dalaram for your beautiful music. Next, I'm pleased to introduce a talk by Anne Van Kamp, Curator of Northern European Art at the Ashmolean. In the spirit of the new year and new beginnings, Anne will be talking about a new Ashmolean acquisition, Le Hamu, by Elizabeth Sondrell. Hello everyone at home. My name is Anne van Kamp and some of you might already know me as the curator of Northern European Art at the Ashmolean Museum who recently organized the Young Rembrandt exhibition. Um, in March when lockdown hit the country and the museum and therefore also the Rembrandt exhibition had to close its door, I was not just sitting at home twiddling my thumbs but instead I was working on an online version of the Young Rembrandt exhibition and I also managed to secure a new acquisition for the museum and it's about this new acquisition of stunning watercolour that I really wanted to talk to you today. Not only is it a very beautiful drawing but I'm also very proud that we managed to acquire a work of art by a woman artist and as you know women artists are still very much underrepresented in museums collections worldwide and this is no different at the Ashmolean. So without further ado, I present to you Le Rameau, or Palm Sunday um, in English, by the French artist Elisabeth Sorel. Um, and she made this uh, watercolor in 1897, as you can see from the signature in the lower left. Um, and this was at the age of 23. So a very young, but a very um, accomplished work by this French artist, Elisabeth um, Sorel. Um, I'm now looking at the drawing on my computer screen because I'm, I'm, I still get very excited um, looking at it um, and I wanted to describe it to you in as much detail as possible. So we can see these two women um, being represented in front of a golden um, mystical background and this is very typical um, of Sorel 
Um, the women are represented from their waist upwards. Um, and if you look at their faces, you can see that they come from different generations. So the one um, on the left um, is much older than the one on the right. And it's possible that they're mother and daughter, we don't know. Um, what we can see is that they both seem to be engaged in prayer. And so the women, the younger woman at the right, she is um, experiencing her faith in a very different manner than um, the older woman at left. And so the younger woman, for instance, you can see her staring in the mid distance. She's very introspective. She's really sort of experiencing um, a very internal um, devotion to her faith. Well, the older woman, you can see she's holding a prayer book, a little missile, which is decorated um, with illustrations. And she's also holding a branch, um, a, a twig. Um, and in fact, the, the French title of this work, Les, Les Rameaux, translates as the branches in English. And it refers normally to the branches, the palm fronts carried during Palm Sunday. Obviously, in, Fra in France, where Sorel was working, and especially in Paris, where she made this drawing, there were no palm trees. So rather than using um, palm leaves on Palm Sundays, for instance, uh, branches of boxwood were used, and that's what we see here, and which has lent um, the drawing with this title. Um, if you look a bit closer at the drawing, you can also see that the artist has drawn it very skillfully. She's made it in watercolor, and so while she initially sketched the outlines of the women in graphite, she then applied very delicate, very subtle layers of watercolor. And for instance, if you look at the brown sleeves um, on the women here, you can see that she used different shades of brown. And by layering those, she's really recreating a, a feeling, a texture of velvet. And it's like you can almost touch it and feel the soft velvet. Similarly, with their headdresses, they're so elaborate and she's drawn them so in so much detail that we can almost feel those amazing veils that the women um, are wearing. I want to talk a bit more um, about the artist Elizabeth Sanghel now. And so when she grew up, she was the daughter of an amateur artist in Tours. Um, she already showed great promise. But at that time, women were not allowed, for instance, to join the prestigious state-funded art school in Paris, the Ecole des Beaux-Arts. So what Elizabeth, did, what Elizabeth did when she moved to Paris in 1891 is she joined a private art academy, the Académie Julien, which was very well respected and where women were allowed to receive the same training as their male counterparts. But unfortunately, they had to do all the training and the studio work separately. But at least they were allowed um, to have the same classes. And so her talent was very soon recognized there, and she was very much respected um, by her male counterpart. She was even invited to um, submit and exhibit works at the Salon, um, the salon um, in Paris. So when Elizabeth Sorel moved to Paris in 1891, she wasn't allowed to join the state-funded prestigious um, art school, the Ecole des Beaux-Arts. There, but she joined um, a very good um, private art academy, the, the Académie Julia, where she was allowed to receive the same training as her male counterparts, although she couldn't uh, be in the same classes or do the same studio works, but at least she had um, a very similar training. She was very well respected um, by her fellow students and teachers, um, and she, um, she quickly gained um, recognition and was invited to exhibit her works um, at the Salon, the annual art fair um, in Paris. And she even won some medals and prizes there, but she never became as famous as her, as her male counterparts. And you probably never heard of this artist uh, before my presentation today. Um, and so she was very famous um, for her Art Nouveau posters in the style of Alphonse Mucha, but also for large watercolors featuring women of which the Ashmolean um, acquisition is a great example here. Um, and so she was inspired by um, Renaissance Italian artists like Botticelli, for instance, but also the British pre-Raphaelite artist and um, her French contemporary symbolist artist. And we see all those influences in this drawing um, here. 
So despite being very popular, widely recognized with prizes and medals during her lifetime, she never really gains international um, recognition and attention. And it's only in the last few years that Sorrel has sort of come more to the forefront. And it's shamefully to say that none of her works have been represented in British public collections until now, but that's why I'm very excited why, that this new acquisition has finally brought this woman artist um, into the limelight. And so it's very excited for me to present um, this new acquisition, this drawing by Elizabeth Sorel um, to you today, and hopefully she will again uh, receive the attention she so much deserves. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Anne, for that fantastic talk. Such a stunning painting. Our final event of the programme combines performance poetry by Uton Daly and storytelling by Amantha Edmead. Amantha is an actress, storyteller and drama practitioner and has been performing for over 25 years. She founded Kumbania Arts Theatre Company in 2009, whose work celebrates African and Caribbean historical and contemporary stories and experiences. The story you will hear is A Nancy and the Tug of War, and the introductory poem is called Hope by Euton Daly from his book Ending the Silence. Euton is a consultant, project manager, performance poet and DJ, and is also on the One World Committee. Hope infuses these performances. Amantha shared her reflections with us about her contribution, which is inspired by the global spotlight on Black Lives Matter last year after the public murder of George Floyd. Hope for her came from African heritage communities for the first time in her experience, talking about the daily occurrences of racism that they endure and usually just accept as part of everyday life. She finds hope in the fact that these things are being voiced and that an end to this silence opens up the possibility for healing and change. Over to Uton and Amantha and thank you. Hope. Hope. H O P E. Hope. So much hangs on such a small word. Such a small word, yet filled with so much promise. So much hope. Hope gives rise to possibilities. Hope provides a sense of purpose. Hope is that thing which makes you face each and every day. To hope is to dream. To hope is to have faith that not everything in life is black and white, white or wrong. That the grass is not greener on the other side. That politicians can be truthful. To hope is to see the bombs behind the platitudes and rhetorics. To hope. to hope is to believe that others will believe, will follow, and that we the people can, no, we the people will make a difference. But beware. To hope implies to take action, to do something. It relies on a different mindset. Therefore, it takes effort. To hope is hard work. It requires a can-do, will-do attitude. It requires patience and impatience, tact and diplomacy. That we see the glass as half full, not half empty. And that we give selflessly to others without thoughts of personal gain. So be prepared to graft. For such a hard, small word, it is often hard to achieve. But to not try is not worth contemplating. To hope, to hope is to be optimistic. To hope. to hope is to look to the future. To hope, to hope is to dream. To, to hope, hope is to believe. I need you to hope. 
Hope prepares you for battles with the enemies. Hope allows you to fight back even against gigantic odds. Hope enables you to strive and to thrive. Hope is enlightenment. So breathe. Fill your thoughts with a thousand hopes. For hope induces self-respect, dignity, pride. When a nation lives in hope, hope echoes across the land and a great rejoicing is felt, for then we truly believe. To hope is to dream, to believe utopian dreams. Onward, marching, forward, marching, never stop, marching. Utopia, onward, marching, forward, marching, never stop, marching. Utopia. Utopian dreams. I'm hopeful. I am forever hopeful. I'm full of hope and I need you to hope. Hope. Just cause it's so, don't make it good. Just cause it's so, don't make it right. Just cause it's so, don't make it true. Things can change for you. Raise your voice now. One of the things I was thinking about as coming from Caribbean heritage is the power of story and the power of Calypso um because calypsonians brought fun knowledge they, they were the griots of the caribbean and they also brought hope and that's something that song and story have a power to do so my little ditty of just cause it's so don't make it good just cause it's so don't make it right just cause it's so don't make it true Things can change for you. Raise your voice now. It's something that I resonated with me when hearing people speak their truths about the little, little microaggressions of day in, day out that we've always just got on with, just shouldered and got on with. So what I'm going to share with you, my story of hope is an Anansi story. And um, Anansi stories travel to the Caribbean with the people who had been enslaved. So they traveled across the seas from West Africa to the Caribbean and throughout that whole period of enslavement and even to the present day, they brought joy, they brought fun, they brought knowledge, they brought wisdom, and they also brought hope. So the story I'm gonna share with you is Anansi and the tug of war. When I say crick, you say crack. Crick, 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 crack. A long, 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 long time ago. And Nancy was relaxing on his favorite patch of grass. The sun was beating down hard, hard, hard. And Nancy just closed his eyes and began to sleep. Now, Nancy is a spider. He also is a man. And still, he snored lightly in, lightly out. It was a beautiful day with the sun beating down hot, 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 hot. Elephant also came to his favorite patch where he would like to just relax and sleep in the sun. So Elephant found his patch, sat himself down and started to sleep when he could feel something just underneath his hard, hard hide. Can you guess what happened? Elephant had sat right down on Mr. Anansi and squashed him. Elephant lifted himself up. Mr. Anansi protest loud, protest quiet. <sighs> Mr. Anansi said to Elephant, Elephant, how you could come squash me? Me know me small, but me still important. Just cause you're so big and so strong. You think you is the strongest one of all? Elephant looked at Mr. Anansi as if he was no more than a tiny fly 
he snorted with his trunk. Because <laughs> I am the strongest one of all. I am elephant. Mr. Anansi, no harm done. Move and go long. Let me go to sleep. Mr. Anansi was not about to let things lie like that. Elephant, I will challenge you to a tug of war. You may be big and I may be small, but I might be the strongest one of all. Yes, you guessed it. Elephant did laugh and laugh after Anansi. <laughs> Mr. Nancy, just move from me. I want to sleep. How could you ever be strong as me? I will not waste my energy with a tug of war. Elephant rolled over and fell asleep. Mr. Nancy tied a rope made out of vines and leaves and twigs, remember him magic, and mixed up with his webs into a strong rope and he tied it around elephant's tail he then made his way along the path through the forest through what looked like unkept jungle all the way through to open land to the beach and the shoreline mr anansi watched out to sea and he could just see the fin could it be a dolphin no it was the killer whale Mr. Anansi summoned the killer whale. Killer whale, come! I have a question for you. Killer whale was just relaxing, but came to see what Mr. Anansi could possibly want with him. Anansi said, Killer whale, um, do you consider yourself to be uh, the biggest and strongest creature in these seas? Killer Whale just let some water out and said, I, of course, am the biggest and strongest creature in all of the seas. Not only the seas, but on the land too, where you walk. And Nancy looked at Killer Whale and said, Killer Whale, you are indeed large and strong, but I, small as I am, Mr. Anansi, I am sure I could beat you in a tug of war. Killer Whale laughed as only a killer whale could. Mr. Anansi, that could never, ever, ever be true. But I will take you upon your challenge. Come, tie that rope you have there to my fin. I hope that you are good at water skiing. Mr. Anansi did as he was asked. He tied the rope to the top of Killer Whale's fin as securely and tightly as he could. He then said, Killer Whale, I may be small, but I too can be strong. I'm going to go right, 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 you see? Fart in the trees and everything and I'm going to get a really good grip with all my eight legs on the rope and when I pull when you feel just a little tug because at first I start you know just a little gently all I want you to do is swim as far as you can and see who between us as you swim and pull the rope I'll pull the rope in the other way Mr. Killer Whale decided to see what would happen Mr. Anansi disappeared out of view and Killer Whale was just there relaxing in the sea. Mr. Anansi used all of his might and all of his power to tug and tug on the rope in the direction of Killer Whale. When Killer Whale felt a tug on the rope, he decided he would show in and see who was who and what was what. And he began to swim with all of his might out to sea, pulling the rope as he went. What do you think happened as he pulled the rope? Remember who's on the other end? The other end of the rope had elephant. Elephant felt a tug on his tail. He was woken out of his slumber and soon was being dragged through the land, knocking down trees, moving animals in his way. Elephant thought, what is this? 
I, big strong elephant, being pulled and pulled by Mr. Anansi Spider, not a tink and go so. Mr. Elephant got to his feet and then began to pull and pull and pull on the rope, moving further and further away. Well, Mr. Whale thought he would swim far and far into the sea. Then he felt a tug on the rope, could not believe it. He found himself being pulled back to the shore. <gasps> Mr. Weir said, what is this? Could that tiny Mr. Anansi be so strong as to pull me? The great killer whale, not a tingo so. I gone swim faster. And you can guess what happened. Mr. Whale swam faster and faster out to sea, while Elephant, he moved faster and faster into land. And the rope pulled this way and that way. And Anansi stood in the middle and watched both of these big, strong animals pulling and pulling. And he said, just cause it's so, don't make it good. Just cause it's so, don't make it right. Just cause it's so, don't make it true. Things can change for you. Both of these animals were determined to show that they were bigger and stronger than tiny Mr. Anansi. And they went on for hours and hours, pulling the rope this way and that way. And Anansi just sang, just cause it's so, don't make it good. Just cause it's so, don't make it right. Just cause it's so, don't make it true. Things can change for you. Hours passed. Elephant was exhausted. Hours passed. Killer whale was exhausted. The rope was tight. And both animals were too tired to continue. Mr. Anansi went to where Elephant was and said, Elephant, you have anything to say? Elephant looked at Mr. Anansi and said, Mr. Anansi, you know what? I'm sorry. I'm uh, sorry, I'm uh, sorry, I'm uh, sorry. I ever just assumed that you were tiny and weak and I was big and strong. I will never make that mistake again. Whenever me see any creature, whatever size, I will not judge them in that way because you're small, but you're strong. Mr. Anansi then went to the shore where he found Killer whale almost beached, exhausted. He said, killer whale, you big, big, strong killer whale, you have anything to say? Killer whale said, oh, Mr. Anansi, you are indeed strong. I was wrong to think that you were so tiny and weak and insignificant. What a mistake I make. I will never judge another animal, small or big, on the sea or in, on, in the sea or on the land in that way again. I am very sorry. And Nancy looked upon him and said, You are indeed big and strong, killer whale, but... Just cause it's so, don't make it good. Just cause it's so, don't make it right. Just cause it's so, don't make it true. Things can change for you. Mr. Anansi caught the rope and set both of these huge, strong, powerful animals free. He hoped that they had both learned their lesson. Because he, as Mr. Anansi, was left feeling happy, 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 skipped off to go find himself something good to eat. And as he went, he sang, just cause it's so, don't make it good. Just cause it's so, it don't make it right. Just cause it's so, it don't make it true. Things can change for you. Raise your voice now. Many thanks to Amantha and Newton for those powerful and inspiring performances. Hope is the most important word, and as Newton explored in his poem, is a word that calls for action and effort from all of us to play our part and make a difference with kindness and determination. And in the spirit of hope, 
I'd like to say goodbye and thank you and hand over to Jane for a final few words. Thank you, Javid. Thanks so much. We are still in January, so we can still just about wish you Happy New Year and all the very best for 2021. Many thanks again to all the faith leaders who took part in the panel discussion, to Anne Van Camp and to all the wonderful artists who contributed to this event. And thanks to you for watching. And please join us again at 2.30 on Sunday the 14th of February for our next Chinese New Year and love-inspired One World event. Goodbye everyone and take care.